Oh, continue. Okay. Here I go. Here I go. Ready? Hello and welcome to APS Stamp Chat. My name's Heidi Rhodes. Today's guest joins us from Princeton, New Jersey. Daniel Kurtz is currently an adjunct professor of history and social sciences at Middlesex County College in Edison, New Jersey. He earned his BA and MA degrees from Rutgers University, where he studied history and political science. He has been recognized for his teaching excellence through his recent nomination for adjunct, adjunct professor of the year. He has published articles on numerous topics from the temperance coffee house movement of the late 1800s to the journalist projects in East Africa. He currently resides in the Princeton area with his wife and son. Today's Stamp Chat is sponsored by the APS Membership Department. When you become a member of the American Philatelic Society, you join 134 years of fellowship in the hobby. Member benefits include a subscription to the American Philatelist, access to the APRL, exclusive member-only video content, and much, much more. Visit stamps.org to join today. The American Philatelic Society, social since 1886. And now for our feature presentation, Sydney's Post Office and British Imperial Postal Culture. Thank you, Mr. Kurtz. Thanks. Thanks. It's great to be here. Thank you so much. Oh, we have to share your screen. Oh, okay. Were you you were giving a PowerPoint, right? Uh, I have a few I have a few uh, pictures to show. Okay, um, great. On, yeah. Um, so, yeah, it's true. How do I how do I uh, go about that? Oh my goodness. It's okay. Um, so you'll see the button for share screen. Oh, share screen. Right. I see it. Very good. Okay. Hold on a minute. Mm -hmm. Okay, let me let me bring up my um, hold on. Let me just bring up my uh, my stuff here. Okay, hold on. Um. Okay. Okay. Share screen. Let's go to share screen. Right. Okay. Desktop one. Whiteboard. Okay. So press that. Right. Okay. Share. Oh, okay. Okay, there so we go. Now I'm sharing my screen. Okay. Now we're seeing your Twitter. <laughs> right. Yeah, you're seeing. Right, you're seeing. You're seeing all my stuff. Okay. Um, okay. What I'm going to do uh, is I'm going. First of all, um, hello. Thank you so much to everybody who's joining all over the world. It's really, um, it's really an honor to like be able to talk about a subject that endlessly fascinates me, which is uh, communications history, uh, postal history. Um, and that kind of that kind of thing, and um, I've been uh, you know writing a lot and studying a lot about um, Victorian culture, but especially uh, letter writing culture, which I feel is um, something that is uh, you know an extremely powerful force in history. And really, before the Victorian era, really before the 1800s, is is unprecedented. It's it's and and I'm going to talk about that. Okay, all right. Anyway. Um, what I wanted to uh, begin with, if that's okay, um, is I want to talk about this stamp. This stamp here. Can you see, uh, Heidi, can you see the stamp? Can everybody see the stamp? Yep, it looks good. Okay, good. Okay. All right, this stamp. Okay, this stamp is um, probably along with Gutenberg's Bible of 1450 one of the most important pub and impactful publications in history, um, even though, you know, there were, you know, millions of these stamps printed up, but the stamp in and of itself is extremely important because what it does is it recognize, it, 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 it's a turning point. It's a sea change um, in the way that people see themselves in relation to the state and how they see themselves in relation to, um, to empire. So just allow me to explain. So basically, uh, as you know, many, uh, many people know, um, you know, Britain, uh, you know, is the first country to undergo an industrial revolution, right? And Britain is undergoing an industrial revolution starting in the late uh, 1700s. And what was going on during this industrial revolution is that people were, for the first time, really, really on the move, okay? but they're on the move in one direction. It's not like today's mobile society where people are constantly going back and forth. It didn't work like that. People were constantly leaving. They were just leaving, 
okay? So, you know, you would, you know, typically millions of people, millions of middle class people, millions of working class people, what you would do is, you know, you would originate from a small town or a hamlet and you'd make your way to a large city like London or Leeds or Manchester or Liverpool, okay? And because of the nature of the postal service until 1840, unless you were someone who was extremely wealthy or a member of parliament, you fell off the face of the earth to everybody you ever knew as soon as you were about 20 miles away from home. You, they, they were just like, goodbye, okay? Um, and this is a theme that pervades all throughout Victorian literature, the idea of people coming and going. It's like a really, really big deal. Um, so the problem with this was caused by the fact that Britain um, has, you know, Britain does have a postal service. Um, but basically, when we look at the history of postal services, we see three stages of postal services. I mean, there's a lot of different ways, okay? The first stage is basically the purely imperial system, which is the Roman system. You know, everyone's always like, oh, you know, ancient Rome, they're so incredible. They were so networked. They had a postal system. They did. They did have a postal system, and it was extraordinary, but it was only for government officials. Normal, everyday people, even wealthy people, they, they couldn't use it. They, they couldn't use it. They weren't allowed to use it. So even at the height of the Roman Empire, uh, during the time of apostle of the apostle Paul, Paul is sending people with his letters. He's sending people to like deliver his letters. So there's no concept, there's no idea that I'm aware of in Roman history where someone's like, you know, maybe we should expand this to the common folk. It, I, I mean, I could be wrong, but I don't think so. Then what you have is you now the the British model starts out like that. The British model in the um, in the 15 and 1600s starts out like that. It's really Royal mail is really for government officials. It's for the king, it's to gather intelligence, it's to talk to his various agents all over the country, okay? Then what you wind up having is you have a situation where you have kind of a postal service as a taxation device, as a revenue raising device. So the state is looking at providing a service, but they wanna make money, okay? So this is really the status of the British postal system in the late 1700s and early 1800s. So it's very, very dysfunctional from a modern day point of view. A person basically was responsible for the price of postage when the mail was delivered to you. And even though, you know, with money, it gets kind of messed up. For lack of a better term, I mean, I'm sorry, for lack of a better way of putting it, basically to mail a letter over a significant distance was about the cost of an average day's labor, maybe a little less. OK, so if you want to convert that into modern money, which you really can't do, you're talking about like $60, 60, 70 US dollars, right, you know, to, to mail a letter to somebody. Now, there were certain people who didn't have to pay. And those were people who were members of parliament and members of parliament who gave permission to other people to use their franc or use their uh, their signature to send for free. OK, so basically what that does is that puts postal communications at a premium. And not only that, but it also creates an extremely inefficient system and it leads to a lot of corruption where you have postal carriers who are determined to get money. So it like sets up almost like a predatory relationship between like the, the, the deliverer and the receiver, you know, like you would, you would see a post office, I mean, you'd see a postal employee in like 1790 and you go, oh man, then what is this going to cost me? You know, so it didn't exactly encourage connectivity or communication, right? And generally what this meant is this meant that even if you were a middle-class person, even if you were a middle-class person, right? Um, you, you know, the idea of engaging in vigorous letter writing communication with people at a distance was just something that generally wasn't really heard of. Some people did employ it and some people did do it, of course, right? We have some famous letter writers of the 1700s, but you know, basically for the average everyday person, it, it wasn't a consideration. The only time that a normal person would use the postal service um, before 1840 is if, you know, you had something extraordinary to tell someone, like your aunt died, or please come home because your mother's very sick, you know, or something along those lines, right? So basically, there is no postal culture, you know, there's no postal culture. So what winds up happening is in the 1830s, in the 1830s, Britain is going um, 
through a heightened state of industrial revolution. So what was really getting hot in the late 1700s is really, really uh, like on like level 20 you know, by the 1820s and 30s, okay? And you, and you have millions and millions of people who are pouring into the largest cities in Britain, um, especially London. You have lots of political discontent. Um, you have very violent demonstrations. And you have kind of like a, like, like, like almost like a Dickensian anxiety that's going throughout the, uh, the entire population. And you can actually read about this in the pamphlets of the time on all different subjects, you know, on, you know, uh, on harmful liquors or prison reform or anything. What you see is basically a concept that we call in sociology, atomization, atomization, A-T-O-M, meaning people might be gathering in great groups. They might be, you know, um, you know congregating, but they're not networked. They're not networked. They're all like kind of like floating around, kind of like, you know, if you look down Fifth Avenue in New York City on a nice day, and you see all these people walking, they're all walking together, but they're walking alone. So in a sense, that's what was going on in Britain, especially with the middle and working classes, is that you had atomization, which had not occurred before because when everyone was living in a small town, generally people were able to keep up with each other, okay? So, What's going on is you have a very interesting character, a man named Roland Hill. Um, and Roland Hill um, is really one of the most brilliant people in history. People say, well, he's the inventor of the postage stamp. He's not the inventor of the postage stamp, okay? He's the inventor of modern postal culture, all right? It, it's really disrespectful and historically inaccurate to like reduce him to a postage stamp, you know, or use that kind of um, language, because it's just not true. Um, and basically, Roland Hill comes up with the idea, and he writes a, several, long, um, several long brochures about basically a uniform penny postal single market national uh, system um, where the sender would bear the responsibility um, and that the state would be able to bring in an enormous amount of money through an economy of scale, meaning it's not that the mail would be so profitable on an individual basis, but when you added it all up, it would be a huge revolution in revenue collection. And in fact, it would pay for itself very quickly. It would pay for, that's what he, he, he stipulated. But it's more than that. It's more than that. Basically what Roland also is stipulating is that it would bind together the people as a national community. It would ease a lot of anxiety. Right. And also what it would do is it would put, he didn't use this language, but I'm using this language. It would put everybody on the grid. Okay. Basically everybody eventually in some form would be reachable. That's a, that's, that's huge. That's universal. I mean, a uni that, that's like a, that's a revolution in sociology and psychology, right? If you were the average everyday person anywhere in the world in the early 1800s, um, you know, nobody cared. I mean, you know, you went, you did what you had to do and, you know, you made money or whatever, but, you know, no one really ever like reached you or whatever, unless you, unless you spoke to them or, 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 or in your job, right? But now what was going to happen is that if you were going to pass penny postage, you were going to have a situation where, you know, eventually you could, you, you could get a message to somebody and dependably so. And what this means is this means that you're going to have a newer sense of consciousness, which we call presence, okay? Meaning that, you know, to make up a story that happened, right? Like, so let's say that you move from your small town to London, right, in 1850, and, you know, you say goodbye to everybody and you go there. That's not the end of all of your relationships. That's not the end of your social capital. That's not the end of your, of your personal network or relationships that maybe you've made with institutions and people over the course of decades, okay? Um, you're somebody, you're, you're, you're somebody, you're part of a much larger network. And this aspect of networking begins to change the way people relate to each other and people relate to the state. And it's a revolution. It had never happened before, okay? So this combination of having this kind of flat rate national postal system 
coupled with the idea that everybody was going to be reachable through emissive, right? And that the system and that the state would be vested in making it work, right? So it would be state backed. That, that had never happened in history before. That was like a huge, huge deal, okay? And it's, uh, it's reflected in British in, uh, imperial postal culture, which is what I'm going to be talking about today, okay? Which is the idea that the, the, you know, of course, the British Empire, as it begins to expand, the modern British Empire, not the one that they lost in North America in the 1770s and 80s, but the modern one, you know, the one that involves India and Australia and, um, you know, in South Africa and uh, Canada and whatnot. Um, you know, the idea that it was going to try to be some kind of formative single unit, which it never really is. Um, you know, that, 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 that's something that, um, you know, postal culture starts to develop as well. And what's very, very interesting about British imperial postal culture is that it develops in different places in different ways, depending on how the British see the people who live in the territory and what the territory has to offer Britain. That's what's very, very important, okay? So in some places, okay, Britain is always gonna have the imperial model. It's not, meaning like Britain is gonna basically, even up into the early 20th century, Britain has almost no interest, no interest in uh, helping a colonial area network. They're, they're not interested in that. They're interested in extracting wealth. They, they, they don't care about knowledge or anything along those lines, right? You have that, right? And basically you have that in a British colony like Kenya, like in East Africa, right? That's a good example. You know, Britain doesn't really build a lot of infrastructure in Kenya because, you know, they have a construct of what they want from it, right? Then you have like the, the kind of like mixed situation where Britain doesn't really know where to make up its mind, right? So it has a large colony, but develops it unevenly. Um, and, you know, probably a very good example of that uh, would be, hmm, a good example of that would probably be like the Caribbean. Okay, so, you know, in the late 1800s and early 1900s, uh, there are some Caribbean islands that are pretty well networked and others that the British really aren't that concerned about. Um, so there, they're not really doing a lot. And then you have the idea that Britain is going to bring the quote unquote blessing of postal networking um, to a colony and that it was gonna invest a lot of money and a lot of resources. And this is amazing because the British could never quite make up their mind why they even had an empire by the 20th century. Um, you know, do we have an empire to profit off of colonies and exploit people? Or do we have an empire to spread the blessings of Western civilization, including literacy and connectivity, right? So they can't quite make up their mind, you know? So what we see is we see postal systems developing accordingly, you know, is what we see, which is extremely interesting. And it's reflected in postal architecture and letter writing uh, styles and, and that kind of thing. Right, wait, am I still, oh, Heidi, um, I was waiting for you to talk. Oh no, you're, you're good. Oh, I'm good, okay. You're, yeah, you're giving a nice prologue. Oh, a nice prologue, okay, yes. okay. So anyway, so if you're taking a look at this, this is the penny postage stamp. This is the stamp where for one penny, you could send, I believe, a half ounce letter anywhere in the British Isles. So, you know, at this time, Ireland isn't independent yet. So, you know, the British Isles are, you know, Britain, uh, Ireland, and, you know, the small islands around it, right? Um, and then for, I believe, for two pennies, you could send upwards to like like uh, like an ounce or two ounces, okay? And even though, of course, we know there's a lot of poverty at this time in history, and we know all about Victorian poverty, um, you know, to be perfectly honest with you, this makes correspondence for just about everybody who had any ability to write, it, it opens up the system. It, it opens up the system, and the system begins to react exponentially like you'd expect it to. You know, it really does, okay? So that's very, very important. And of course, here we have the situation where the royal image in the sense that we have Victoria's you know, head, uh, this is gonna be something that's also gonna be a constant theme um, on British official documents is the image of the monarch, okay? Which is uh, very, very important. Okay, super important. Um, 
then uh, basically what we have, which is um, extremely interesting, is I want to talk a little bit about um, I want to talk a little bit about Australia, okay? And if it's okay with you, Heidi, if I could just bring this image up, absolutely. If if my computer will cooperate, it maybe won't. Come on, computer, will you cooperate? Okay, now it's gonna. Cooperate. Okay, all right. So there, we're taking a look at Australia. Now, this is one of my favorite maps. This is one of my favorite maps. This map only came out a few years ago, a few months ago, when you had the Australian wildfires. And a lot of Americans just didn't quite understand, like, you know, they knew Australia was around, but like, how big is it? Okay, the answer is, it's big. Australia is really, really, really huge, okay? Australia is as large as the continental United States, but there are some distances in Australia, as you can see, from Hobart to the York Peninsula all the way up here, which are just like, you know, 2,500, 3,000 miles, okay? I mean, you have absolutely, um, you know, an enormous patch of land, okay? So Britain has basically, for lack of a better term, four gigantic colonies around the late 1800s, four gigantic colonies, right? It's got Canada, okay? It's got Australia, it's got South Africa and it's got India, all right? Now remember, British India isn't just what modern India is. British India is what today is modern day India, Pakistan, Sri Lanka, Nepal, Bangladesh, Bhutan, and uh, Burma, Myanmar, okay? So these are enormous, enormous territories with millions of people that need networking, okay? Now when you take a look at Australia, Australia is a miracle. It, it really is. Australia is like a, is a miracle. You know, as Americans, we're always taught, you know, America's a miracle. America was born modern. You know, we have the, this constitutional convention and it's all true. You know, it, it is all true in, in that respect. America, to my knowledge, is the first country that as part of its fundamental constitution has a postal service. The postal service is actually in the constitution in, in I believe, article one right, uh, that Congress is, is responsible for establishing post offices and post roads, 99% sure. But anyway, when you take a look at Australia, right, Australia is born modern, right? And Australia by the late 1800s is bringing in millions and millions of, re of well, you know, immigrants from uh, especially uh, the British Isles, okay, from Britain and Ireland and parts of Europe. It becomes more difficult for anyone who's not European to settle in Australia because the Australians passed what's called the White Australia Policy um, in the late 1800s. Uh, so, you know, basically what you're, what you're looking at here is you're looking at a completely Anglophone, Anglophonic, you know, um, if that's, if I can make up a word, um, you know, uh, environment, okay? Um, so, What's really interesting about Australia is that when Australia begins to get settled in its modern period in the late 1800s, I know it starts out as a prison colony in the early 1800s, we're not talking about that. We're talking about the idea of Australia being a modern industrial state. Um, the Australians are acutely aware immediately that they, they need to embrace postal and telegraphic communications and they need to subsidize it. They need to subsidize it in a big way and that the country isn't going to work without it. It's, it's, it's not going to work. It's not going to be, it's not going to be possible to run the entire operation without a single market postal system and also a uh, advanced telegraph system. By the late 1800s, early 1900s, you could see this all throughout their literature, right? You can see this all throughout their literature. And just like the United States, the Australian federal government in its own constitution is responsible for a national postal service. So it's actually hardwired into the Australian system. It's hardwired into the Australian system. Okay, very good. All right. And also there's a very, very important development going on for Australia in the late 1800s. And that's this. This is the Suez Canal. Okay. The Suez Canal, which comes around in around 1870, and the British take it over in the 1880s, um, what it really does is it sets up a shortcut in postal communications to Australia and New Zealand and India. Um, and, you know, basically not only that, but also as you can see with the map, 
um, you no longer have to go all the way around uh, the Cape of Good Hope in order to get into the Indian Ocean and the Pacific. Now what you could do is use the relatively mild Mediterranean Red Sea corridor, relatively mild, certainly in some respects more mild than the Atlantic, uh, in order to get to in order to get to Australia and uh, and New Zealand. Okay, so that's that's extremely important. That's extremely important. Okay, and basically what I want to take a look at now, if it's okay with you, is the is the Sydney General Post Office. If I can get a uh, get a picture of it. Hold on a minute. Okay, there's the inside of it. There's the outside arcade, and there's good. And here is the Sydney Post Office. Okay, so let's talk about this. Okay, and again, I apologize if I'm going too fast. I did drink a lot of coffee, like too much coffee. And there's a lot so, of ground to cover. There's a lot of ground to cover. You know what I mean? But uh, okay, if you take a look at, let's talk about for a second, Melbourne and Sydney. Okay, and the idea of what we call the in history and sociology the Omphalos effect or the Metropole effect, okay? In history, and this is true for Americans, everyone has in their head a civilizational center or a location that represents the middle of everything, right? So for most Americans, you could say, well, it's Manhattan, it's Times Square, right? You know, um, the center of the center of the center, the Omphalos, which is Greek for belly button, right? In Judaism, it would be Jerusalem, right? You know, uh, the city of Jerusalem, the Temple Mount, you know. So we see this all throughout history, right? So for Victorians, it was London, okay? It was London. London was the center of the center of the center, okay? Everything, whether you liked London or you hated London or it didn't make a difference, okay? Everything good and bad in the world, interesting and boring, constructive and destructive somehow either emanated from London or passed through it, you know? So London is the metropole. It is the omphalos. It is the psychological center for everyone in the British empire, even if they had never stepped foot there or ever would. Okay. So I'm getting to something. So basically when you're looking at London's civic architecture and you're looking at the fact that almost every person in the city of Sydney, right, in the early 1800s, had been to London or, were, or was from London, right, or passed through, right? Um, progress in an urban center was really measured on how much it looks like London, okay? Even if it didn't look like London, but it felt like London, um, because, you know, people did acknowledge that London had problems, you know, it did. It had some very serious environmental problems and poverty and whatnot. You know, but one thing that London did have was great buildings. London had great buildings and London had the greatest post office building in the world, which by the way, doesn't exist anymore, uh, which was located in, in London. It was this big neoclassical kind of, you know, it looked like, uh, you know, like the United States Capitol without the dome, you know, uh, you know, it was marble clad. It had like, you know, huge, um, you know, stone um, ionic uh, columns and whatnot, uh, incredible reception hall, right? And it was built of stone or, you know. So, oh, so for people in Sydney and Melbourne, you, they knew that they weren't gonna be able to show their political maturity. They knew they hadn't arrived until their city started to look and function like London. And that's why when you go to Sydney today, you have essentially many of the same place names that you have in London, right? You know, it's not a coincidence, you know? So when the Sydney Post Office is built in several stages uh, in the late 1860s, and eventually they're done around 18, 1890, maybe the 1880s, um, you know, basically the idea is that this is going to be a building that is going to literally take London and plop it in the middle of Australia, okay? And that it's going to be made of stone and it's going to be unbelievably massive and enveloping. And it is going to completely ennoble the idea of the letter writer. Now, you can't make this up, okay? Now, let's talk about letter writing for a second. Let's talk about this. Um, 
In the 1700s and the 1600s, an overwhelming majority of people in Britain and in the world are illiterate. They, they can't read or write, right? And, you know, there's no public school generally. And, um, and, and, and you know, it's, it's a real problem. It's a real problem. But interestingly enough, because of the spread of uh, education, even in the early 1800s, um, the average working class person by the 1850s could, could read, a lot of them, and by the 1870s could definitely read. So what you have is you have really soaring literacy rates, um, even on the most basic level, right? So sure, not everybody can write, a, can write like, you know, like Shakespeare or something, but basically the average person by 1880 in Britain could, uh, could write a letter, you know, like, hi, Lisa, how are you? I'm doing well, I really miss you or whatever. You know, maybe not like, you know, write about advanced ideas or philosophy, though a lot of people could do that too, right? So it's the idea that a hallmark of a person of good education is letter writing. That's what you did, you wrote letters, okay? You wrote letters, you wrote a lot of letters, your parents made you write letters, you went to school to learn how to write letters, and you wrote all kinds of letters. There's all kinds of like letter writing manuals, and there's letter writing desks, and, 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 and um, you know, there's, there's, there's furniture desks, there's uh, pri uh, personal desks, which you would lock. Uh, there's entire industries that emanate from letter writing, right? And this is, of course, where you see the beginning of a, a new relationship, which is if you could write a letter to anybody, right, if everybody had an address, it quickly dawns on people, well, I can write a letter to the government. Now, this doesn't necessarily have to do with the traditional English right of petition, right? The traditional English right of petition had a lot of times do with like people who are deeply aggrieved and they wanted to appeal to the king. Uh, which we see in the 1600s, right? This is different. This is what we're talking about, the modern concept of the right of petition, which is the idea of a person sitting down and writing their elected representative or somebody in a position of power over them in a distant place and expecting it to be read and replied to, okay? So that's something that actually on a massive basis is new. The idea that the average person would do this. Not that like, like, you know, massively rich people or assemblies wouldn't petition each other. That, that's old, okay? So basically you have this idea that, uh, you know, if you want to progress without violence, if you want women to have the right to vote, if you want people to stop drinking alcohol, if you want to make prisons into places where people are reformed instead of going to die, right? Um, what you need to do is you need to write letters to convince people in positions of power. So it quickly dawns on the average citizen in Britain and the United States that, and this is true today, and I tell this to my students, a letter, a well-written letter to someone in a position of power, while it can always be refuted, it can't be denied. I'm going to say that again. A petition can always be refuted. Somebody could always say, I disagree with you on this point, on that point, but what they can't say is that it never happened, okay? That's actually a huge jump in political history, all right? Because if you're a member of parliament and you're getting 15, 20 letters every day about an issue, you, you can't convince yourself, you can't say, I mean, unless you're a total sociopath, like, oh, it doesn't matter, I don't care. Well, maybe you, maybe you don't like the issue, maybe you disagree with the issue, but you can't deny that it's an issue, okay? So that's a really, really big deal. And people realize this pretty quickly. Labor leaders, uh, suffrage leaders, uh, reformists, they, they, they get this, they get this pretty quickly, right? So there's the whole idea of teaching people how to petition and also teaching people how to create what we call open letters and letters to the editor. So Victorian letter writing culture isn't just writing a long missive to somebody back in England, I mean, it is. But it's also the idea of the letter as a living thing. And this is why stamp collecting is so cool, right? Because, you know, you collect stamps and there's really two types of stamps that you collect. You collect a stamp that's never been circulated and then you have a stamp that's been canceled, right? 
So if you have a stamp that's never been circulated, well, that's cool, right? You can look at it, you know, it, you know, it hasn't been touched, you know, you still might be able to see some of the, uh, a lot of the, you know, the printing details and the impressions and it's beautiful. It's really cool. But let's face it, a, a canceled stamp's been on an adventure, right? I mean, it has, you know? I mean, if you're looking at a canceled stamp that goes from Hong Kong to London in 1914, oh my God, so what does that mean? Right, so that stamp like basically started in Hong Kong. Somebody wrote a letter. It went on a steamship. It went to Singapore. Then maybe it stopped in um, in, in Mumbai, and then it goes through the Suez Canal, and then it goes all the way up to you know to the mouth of the Thames or the Thames and into London. I mean that that stamp has been on a trip. That's like magic, man. You know, so it's it it really is transformative of that. Anyway, let me, let me um, just get back to uh, the post office. So here what you see is the Sydney post office is going to be a love letter to letter writing. It's going to, it's going to put into stone all the ideas that I'm talking about, right? So here what we have is that in front of the post office, we have an open air arcade, as you can see, okay? And everything's made of stone, 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 okay? And basically, these kinds of arcades, uh, these kinds of neoclassical Palladian arcades, they're actually, they're actually very common in London. It was one of the things that everybody noticed when they went to London, because if you lived in a small town, you never experienced any kind of interior like this, right? So, you know, they replicated it in the Sydney Post Office. It was the idea that, you know, you were, th this was special. You, you were someplace that, that mattered, okay? That's, that's pretty important. And then when you look at the interior of the, um, the structure, you see the enormous amount of care and detail. Uh, you see what looks like to me, you know, really, really, uh, you know, cherry wood oak desks, marble pilasters with Corinthian columns, uh, basically almost like neoclassical Georgian um, accents. Um, and, you know, really this is a place where you were gonna engage in one of the great actions of civilization, which is mailing a letter, right? So along with going to school, so you know, you have schools or going to the library, right? This is gonna be one of the places where civic worship is gonna take place is really what it is. It's like a civic religion, right? Okay, and again, if you could see the completed post office, right? You could see the enormous scale from the point of view of the average person um, in the 1880s. I mean, it is just an absolutely monumental structure, but there's more, okay? And that has to do with its entablature or the different, um, the different sculptures, okay? Because the British were really, really obsessed with the idea, which never really pans out, of the empire as a single connected structure, okay? Um, and again, that never, never really happens, okay? But if you take a look at some of the things that are actually uh, put there, here, if you go, if you go into the Sydney Post Office and you look up, okay, you have this gigantic, detailed, lovingly labored, oh my goodness, you know, uh, masterpiece of, uh, of Queen Victoria and the British Royal Arms, okay? Um, and I mean, it is, is I mean, you know, it, it, it basically is there to say, you know, this, this is something that you are engaging in that is given the royal blessing in faraway London, right? You are, uh, you are plugging into a much, much wider world that goes back, you know, eons into British history, even though you're in Sydney, Australia, right? And again, uh, the lion and the unicorn. So here you see here, uh, the lion and the unicorn, the, of course, the famous emblem of the British monarchy. And you have, of course, the lion on top of the crown and, you know, all these things, you know, anybody would immediately, you know, recognize as, uh, you know, as, as, as British emblems. Um, and again, I want to reiterate, it's stone right? So it's going to be there forever, you know, forever and ever, right? And this would greet you at the entrance, okay? So, but that's not all. It gets cooler. If you take a look at a lot of the different carvings all throughout the arcade, 
what you begin to see is you begin to see the concept of a literate culture pressed into stone. Okay. So basically on the left here, what you see is you see, of course, uh, you see uh, a young woman engaged in letter writing right there. She has her little quill or a little pen or whatever, you know, and uh, I think here you have someone, uh, I don't know what they're doing, if they're typing or I don't know or if they're, I'm not sure. Okay. And here on the other side, of course, you have, um, you do have a modern day print shop and here you have a, a, a typecaster, right? It's not kind of a typewriter, but it, it's for printing, but maybe it is a typewriter. I'm not sure, but that's not the point. The point is, is that, you know, to somebody in the late 1800s and early 1900s, these are very modern images. These aren't like images that like harken back to ancient Rome or Greece, right? And there was a whole debate about this in the Australian parliament about whether or not these, um, these carvings were appropriate. Um, a lot of people said, well, maybe the carvings should be like more classical, you know? I mean, they really shouldn't be this dated. But after a while, the Australian people really, well, the people of Sydney really fell in love with these kinds of, um, these kinds of carvings. And again, it's just a huge, huge salute. Um, it's a validation to the idea of the power of, the power of letters, the power of letters. Okay. Now, let's talk about that. Five minutes. Oh, oh I have five minutes left? Yep. Okay. No, no problem. No problem. Okay. So basically, basically to wrap it up, right? To wrap it up. Okay. When this map is a very important map from 19, from the early 1900s. And what it does is it shows basically letter receiving times based on travel distances from London. Okay. With things in blue being most distant, meaning over 40 days and things in deeper red being more immediate. Right. So it's very interesting because the Victorians are very interested in, in postal connectivity um, all the way up to the end of the Victorian age. Um, and it's something, again, that they regard as a hallmark of, of civilization. But again, largely due to the way that they interpret the inhabitants of a land or their use for it, whether or not they actually invest a deep level of networking is a, is a subject for, you know, for, for another day. Uh, subject for another day. But there's one more thing I wanted to bring up, Heidi, and that's the telegraph. The telegraph is traditionally called the Victorian internet, right? And it kind of is, but it kind of isn't, all right? The telegraph throughout its long history uh, does um, create almost instant communication between people in very long distances. And it's used, you know, like email is by governments, right? And this is why we see World War I break out so quickly, right? And it's used by newspapers. So, you know, what it does is it enables the faster um, dissemination of information. But what it never does is it never opens up the floodgates to really deep, meaningful communication between individuals. It doesn't do that. And that's only because it was always at a premium. So, you know, people would use the telegraph if they had something important to say or you needed to say something to somebody right away. But generally, no one was ever going to go um, and, you know, write like a five page letter to their cousin in America from Britain on a telegraph. You just didn't, you didn't do that. Okay. So, you know, in a lot of ways, the telegraph, you know, it does aid postal culture, but postal culture in and of itself is kind of its own, its own miracle. And it continues with the internet, of course, you know, and that, yeah. So that's pretty much what I have to say. And thank you very much. <laughs> Thank you so much. Uh, I, Should I stop screen sharing? You covered a ton. Yeah, you can stop sharing your screen. You carried. You you were able to get a ton of information okay. in there. Do we? If we have any questions, not yet. But you know, I would like to continue on. You know, it it seemed that like the as we were talking before the show that. Um, the Victorian, the, the imperial British culture, postal culture, really pushed the development of Australia's infrastructure. Recall during oh, yeah. one of our rehearsals how we were talk, talking about airmail. So perhaps you could talk about yeah. that a little bit. Oh yeah, sure, sure. Um, yeah, the Victorians, I'm sorry, not the Victorians, the Australians are the first people uh, to 
to make airmail part of their standard postal system. Now, a lot of people don't know this, but in the United States, up until 1975, you had to pay extra for airmail, like domestic airmail. You actually had to pay extra for that. It was a different mailing class. Um, and the Australians decide as early as the 1920s and 30s that they're going to subsidize that, that they're actually just going to make it part of the standard postal system because they didn't want a situation where it took three weeks for letters to circulate around the country. They didn't want that, right? So the Australians are really the first ones to really fully embrace um, airmail as a fundamental, uh, a fundamental um, function of their, their, their postal system. And um, because the Australians can't see any way that they're going to be able to, to grow. The Australians are really nervous um, and justifiably so in the early, in the early 1900s, they're nervous about the Japanese. They're nervous about the Japanese. Um, they're, yeah, so you might think like, well, what do the Australians have to worry about, right? I mean, they're, you know, at the South Pacific and, you know, and they're under the, the, the protection of the British Empire. And I mean, what, what do they have to worry about? You know, and the answer is no, they did. They were, they, they saw that the Japanese empire was growing rapidly in the uh, Northern Pacific. And they were, uh, and they were, they were nervous. They wanted to further develop their peripheral areas. And if you were going to get anybody to settle in those peripheral areas, you had to get them online. You had to get them on the postal network. So, and eventually, by the way, Japan does attack uh, Australia in World War II. It bombs Darwin. Um, so, yeah, the, so the Australians look at it as a national security imperative. They really do. Yeah. And this was one of the reasons, friends, you know, that I, I asked uh, Professor Kurtz to come on because for all of those who are interested in postal history, I know that this is ringing your bell, but also semiotics, uh, infrastructure, he's just extremely comprehensive and, and you know, and he's a prolific uh, personality on Twitter. You can find him at, at Daniel underscore Kurtz. Yeah, and also I put... Oh, I post okay. on Postal Hit. Yeah, this is the hashtag I usually use, okay, when I'm talking about, yeah, I, I use that hashtag all the time. Just like if, I, if there's something interesting that I see. You know, you could say, oh, well, wait a minute. I saw that on Wikipedia. And I'm like, yeah, right. You know, I, I find it interesting, right? So then don't read it, you know? Well, it's, anyway, a, and it's important to have a repository of all this information because you synthesize it really well. We have a question. Uh, how much does Britain influence the technology of the postal system in paper making and printing? Mm, yeah, that's a good question. Um, yeah, Britain, Britain um, has a huge influence um, in, uh, in paper making and printing. Um, and Br actually, I believe, I could be wrong, that for the first many decades of Australia's existence, the stamps were actually printed up in Britain and shipped to Australia in bulk, right? I mean, eventually the Australians could print their own stamps, but that's not the point. So, and also um, the prepaid envelope, and the prepaid postcard was, uh, you know, was a big deal. It was extremely convenient. We all know this when we were kids, right? So a lot of these things would be printed up in, in Britain and whatnot. And the Victorians were really into stationery. They were into like, you know, the, the, the surface of stationery or how it shimmered or the fonts in, in, in it or the images. They were really, really into that. That was like a, the equivalent of a multi-million dollar industry that begins to spread around the world, you know? And, um, you know, and, and of course, you know, today, you know, whenever you're going to get married, you know, you got to get invitations and whatnot. But the, but the Victorians are doing that every day. Like every day they're sending out invitations and they're, and they're talking to each other and about all kinds of things and whatnot. And, um, you know, they really view the postal service like we view um, email. There's no telephone. I mean, these things are all at a premium until the 1930s. They're all at a premium. Okay, so if you really wanted to talk to the average person, your brother, your wife, your cousin who's moved a thousand miles, you, you had to write a letter. Though, though, and this is this could be a topic for a different day. The typewriter comes in big time in the late 1800s. Oh my God, the Australians they go crazy over typewriters. They go crazy over typewriters. They do, but. We will have to do that. Now the yeah. questions are pouring in. Here we go. So I think okay. it, it, it's fair to say that it, the British did influence the technology. Oh, yeah. 
Yeah, absolutely. How much of Australian postal traffic and revenue involved parcels? Did Australians use mailed parcels to get manufactured items delivered to remote locales? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and I believe the answer is yeah. I believe that Australian Post uh, did engage, I'm pretty sure they engaged in that service. Um, I'm not, that's not like so much my area, but um, I mean, obviously Australia, because it has these vast distances, this was always a major issue. But the Australians developed their, um, their railroads uh, fairly quickly by the late 1800s, early 1900s. So yeah, so that's basically the way that a lot of things would, um, you know, would, would, would move around. Uh, the Australians, for example, they are one of the first major users of what we would call the Sears catalog, right? You know, the idea that you would have a department store and the department store would be in Melbourne, right? And if you moved a hundred miles away, a thousand miles away, you still wanted all the modern conveniences from that. So periodically, you would get you would get um, these these catalogs, and um, that was that, and you could see them on the internet, you know. And um, but again, and I, I'm sorry if I'm going on for too long. You can't forget the importance of London, okay? Even in the early 1900s, right? All banks, all capital, all major, you know, all these major things are emanating eventually from London, eventually from London, right? So everybody is somehow connected to the, the, um, the Amplos, you know, every, everybody. You could be in the middle of Australia and, um, you know, it, you're, still, you're still thinking about that. You're still thinking because your department store might be getting things from London, mm -hmm. you know, yeah. Can you comment on what changed at Federation in 1901 regarding postal history and communications? Yeah, 1901 um, is, well, the Australian Constitution Act of 1900 is passed in London and Australia is essentially, modern Australia is essentially born, for lack of a better term, in 1901. And of course that leads to Australia Post uh, or the Australian Postal Department. And the Australians, they, um, they, they, they're, not, they're not fooling around. Again, they look at the development of a comprehensive postal network that actually operates efficiently as a national security priority. Like how we, the United States in the 1950s, looked at the interstate highway system, right? Like we have all these, a lot of people don't know this, or maybe, you know, we have interstate highways in America today that don't go anywhere. I mean it, right? We have like interstate highways in like Wyoming, and uh, in Montana, that you know, that are just just ribbons of road, right? Um, but Ike Eisenhower was like, no, this is part of a connective infrastructure where the military is going to need to move around massive people and equipment if we ever have to face invasion, right? So the Australians look at that with the development of their um, of their postal system. Uh, they they uh, they really do. Yeah. So the postal system begins to develop pretty rapidly. And the Australians are some of the first people to really experiment with airmail. Um, really, I think like like right near like right near World War One. You know, they're already experimenting with uh, you know with with airmail. So the Australians are always acutely aware that they're you know they're in some respects they're they're on their own and they're they're part of a much a much bigger world you know, a much, much bigger world. They're, they call it the tyranny of distance. Like every Australian, just like every American might know the saying, life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Every Australian kid knows the concept of the tyranny of distance, you know? So everything in Australia is just distance, distance, distance. That's why the Australians have a national broadband network. In America, we don't. In America, the United States government never said, all right, we're gonna lay a fiber optic cable network. That was the job of the telephone companies. But in Australia, oh boy, 10 years ago, they were like, nope, we're going to do this. We're going to wire up the whole, the whole country with fiber optics. And, they and, that, and that's because of the root of that, that Victorian yeah. postal culture. Yeah. Yeah, it's all because of that. It's all because of the idea that, uh, that people need to be able to be uh, interconnected and, and not just interconnected, but talking, talking to each other. You know what I mean? That atomization, A-T-O-M, not A-D, that atomization is bad. Right. I mean, there, you know, when you teach history, you, you, you always teach students history is filled with gray areas. OK, but there are certain things that are bad and disconnectivity is not good. You know, like that, that's not a good thing. OK, for human beings we're we're social 
we're social animals. We need to, I mean, there are times when you want to be by yourself, but we need to have an, you know, an interchange of ideas and products and whatnot. And the Australians really, they really believed in that. And they, they still believe in it. Still do. Of course, they still, they still do. Yeah. So they're a really interesting bunch of people. They really are. Yeah. Well, that'll take us to our, oh, oh we, do, uh, we can't do a national internet service because it has already been commercialized and people are making money on it. Yes. Uh, okay. Yeah. That's, that's <laughs> and then finally, I, and we only have a few minutes left and uh, I'd like to tidy this up, especially okay. letting you, letting all our friends know that we will continue the, this conversation of postal history. Dr. Kurtz, how would you contextualize the transition to email, the changing of everyday communication? Do you consider physical letter writing a soon to be lost art? And I know you love this question. Yeah, this is a really, this is a really, really important question, which is really, do, do letters have power anymore? I mean, do, do they, you know? And the answer is absolutely, absolutely. When I, when I talk about postal history, I'm talking about a continuum that, that continues to this day. So as interested as I am in Sydney's post office, I'm, I, I, I'm interested in the development of Microsoft Outlook and um, Apple Mail and that kind of thing. It's the same continuum. And uh, I believe that, uh, and I could discuss this some other time, we, we're in a golden age of letter writing now. And one of the things that I post on Postal History, the Postal History hashtag, is whenever I see a story about a letter that someone wrote, that a few people wrote, that really begins to change things for good or bad, I'll, I'll post it and comment on it. And uh, letters, again, and I'm going to say this, a letter can be refuted, but it can't be denied. Okay. So one of the things that tyrants like to do, tyrants, is they like to gaslight us. They like to say, well, that's not important, or nobody's really talking about that, or you're crazy, right? Well, okay, but if you have a letter, right, that someone's written, that's comprehensive, that, they, that they've CC'd to eight other people, you've got a situation on your hands. You know what I mean? I mean, you know, you're, you're, you're in a pickle, you know? I mean, you've got you've to answer that. And there are numerous examples uh, every day where this is going on. So no way, man, we're in a, we're, we're, the best thing that you can do, the best form of self-advocacy in the 21st century is still the ability to craft a comprehensive letter. Definitely. Yeah. No doubt. Yeah, and, no I, doubt. and I like how you, you touched on that earlier and that made more sense with uh, the statues of the, the, the letter writers that it was, right. what was it called? Um, the power of the pen. I wrote that in the chat, but it was uh, when you could write to your lawmakers in your assembly. Oh, petition, the power petition. to petition. Right. Mm -hmm. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. No, that's yeah. Right. And that's very important. That's extremely important. No, it is. It's great. And it's awesome. It's really interesting. Well, Professor Kurtz, this time has flown by and I hope that everyone enjoyed it. And I can tell by our chat box and I hope that our future viewers on YouTube also use the comment box, box to continue the conversation. We will have uh, Professor Kurtz back on with us to, to, to explore more and more of the uh, history of communication, communication today and um, the history of imperial postal culture around the world. Thank you so much, Professor, for joining Thanks. us. We really appreciate it. Thanks to all of our viewers and for those who are joining us live. Today's stamp chat was sponsored by the American Philatelic Society's membership department. Becoming an APS member is fast and very simple to do. Just visit stamps.org and apply online. With a price point for every budget, the American Philatelic Society is dedicated to promoting the hobby and making it available and accessible to all. All ages and interest levels are welcome and encouraged to join and become a part of 134 years of fellowship. Join the APS, visit stamps.org and become a member today. For more stamp chats, visit the APS YouTube channel where you can find over 60 presentations. Use the comment box to keep the, the commentary going. You can also go to stamps.org and sign up for our newsletter. You'll be the first to know our upcoming stamp chat presenters. So make sure that you get over to stamps.org and sign up for the e-newsletter. While there, do yourself a favor and register for the virtual stamp show as well. Thanks for joining us and we'll see you on the next stamp chat. Until then, connect, collect, visit stamps.org.
Thank you.